the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty. And to impress him, takes on his multi-armed form and says, Now I am become death. Since the summer of 1942, US forces have been pushing the Imperial Japanese Army back across the Pacific, winning bloody and decisive victories on tiny specks of land like Tarawa, Peleliu and Iwo Jima. By mid-1945, the war in Europe is over and it's apparent the collapse of Japan is near. Now Allied commanders must plan the final knockout blow which will end the Second World War the inevitable invasion of the Japanese mainland. The invasion is codenamed Operation Downfall and legendary US Commander General Douglas MacArthur is placed in overall command. The invasion force is to consist of some 5 million servicemen with landings planned first at Kuishu and then Kanto. However, while military planners work over the details of what will be the largest invasion in history, US commanders ponder the consequences of taking the war directly to the Japanese mainland. Between mid-April and mid-July 1945 alone, Japanese forces have inflicted Allied casualties, totaling nearly half of all those suffered in three full years of combat in the Pacific. Nowhere is this more evident than on the Japanese home island of Okinawa, where US Marines encounter a Japanese force that seemed to become even more deadly and ruthless when faced with certain defeat. US commanders estimate Operation Downfall will cost the lives of over a quarter of a million Allied servicemen, with a further one million expected to be casualties, a price they know will be too high for the American public to accept. Japanese losses are estimated to exceed 10 million. Despite these sobering predictions, and with seemingly no other options available, in mid-July, MacArthur sets a preliminary invasion date for November 1945. Unbeknown to US planners, on July 16, 1945, in the deserts of Almogardo, New Mexico, an implosion device is hoisted into a tower and detonated in a top-secret test known as the Trinity Test. The device generates the explosive power of between 15 and 20,000 tons of TNT and the blast is visible from up to 80 kilometers away. This is the first successful test of a nuclear weaponized device in human history, a feat that has secretly been four years in the making. Under the authorization of then President Franklin D. Roosevelt on December 6, 1941, the Manhattan Project was given the go-ahead under the direction of Chief Scientist J. Robert Oppenheimer to produce a weaponized nuclear device. Now, in 1945, with such a devastating weapon at his disposal, current US President Harry S. Truman warns Japan that should they fail to elicit a satisfactory response to the terms laid out in the July 26 Potsdam Declaration, he will order the prompt and utter destruction of Japan. Consistent with their stance throughout the war, the Japanese militaristic government hold on to their strategy of Ketsu Go and vow to fight on to the death. Truman, despite the moral reservations voiced by many members of his chiefs of staff, hopes to avoid the unacceptable losses of the inevitable invasion and authorizes the use of two atomic bombs on Japan in the hope of forcing Japan to accept the terms of surrender. Late on the evening of August 5th, at the US Army Air Force Base on Tinian Island in the Marianas, 
a B-29 bomber of the 393rd Bombardment Squadron, is fitted with a nuclear fission bomb, nicknamed Little Boy. Only the aircraft's pilot, Colonel Paul W. Tibbet, and his bombardier know the true nature of this mysterious new weapon. Little Man's intended target is the Japanese port city of Hiroshima, as it holds great industrial and military significance, as this is the location of Field Marshal Shunruku Hatta's 2nd General Army, which commands the whole defence of the southern region of Japan. Prior to the attack, the US Army Air Force flies dozens of small-scale missions over Japanese cities in an attempt to wear down the Japanese air defences, in the hope that they will lower their guard by the time the atomic mission arrives. At 0245 on August 6, Colonel Tibbetts and his aircraft Enola Gay take off from Northfield Tinian with Little Boy on board and begin the 2,500 kilometer journey to Hiroshima. At 0550, at 9,200 feet above the island of Iwo Jima, Enola Gay rendezvous with two B-29s, the great artiste and necessary evil, who will accompany her on the mission. Little Boy is then armed in flight, and now there is no going back. At 0700, the B-29 straight flush, commanded by Major Claude R. Earthley, arrives over Hiroshima as part of the weather reconnaissance mission. He broadcasts a message which is picked up by an Gay, reading, Cloud cover is less than three tenths at all altitudes. Advice, bomb primary. 0709, air raid sirens ring out around Hiroshima and nearby cities as the three B-29s are picked up on Japanese radar as they cross the coast. Soon after the warning, the air raid sirens sound the all clear. The US deception missions have worked. Japanese military officials have determined that the aviation fuel supplies are so scarce that there is no sense in sending fighters to intercept three bombers which are likely on a routine recon mission. Enola Gay now has a free run at the target. 0809. As the population below return to their daily lives, Enola Gay arrives above Hiroshima and begins her bomb run. 0815. Little Boy containing 64 grams of uranium-235 is released from the bomb bays of Enola Gay at 31,000 feet. 44.4 seconds later, after being blown off the intended target of the Aoi Bridge by heavy crosswinds, it detonates, 1,900 feet above the Shima Surgical Clinic. The explosion releases the equivalent energy of 16 kilotons of TNT. The heat and blast is so intense that an area of 4.4 square miles is completely reduced to rubble and ash. Some 70,000 people have vaporised, with only shadows scorched into the concrete marking the passing of a life. With 69% of the city destroyed, the survivors of whom some 75,000 are injured, look up to the sky and wonder how could just three aircrafts unleash such devastation. Back in Washington DC, President Truman issues a statement to the world announcing the use of the first ever nuclear bomb and proceeds to threaten Japan with more strikes should they now not accept the terms of the Potsdam Declaration. However, back on the other side of the Pacific, Japanese Prime Minister Suzuki calls a meeting of the Japanese press and reiterates their country's stance to fight on to the death. It seems... Truman has no choice but to authorise one last strike in the desperate hope of forcing Japanese surrender before the looming US invasion. The next target will be the Japanese industrial city of Kokura, which houses a major military arsenal. Originally scheduled for August 11th, predicted bad weather forces commanders to move the mission forward to August 9th. In an almost identical plan to that of the previous strike on Hiroshima, Three B-29s will rendezvous off the coast of Japan before proceeding to the target in a hope that their low number won't attract too much attention from Japanese air defences. Late on the evening of August 8th, the plutonium bomb nicknamed Fat Man is loaded into the bomb bay of Major Charles W. Sweeney's B-29 nicknamed Boxcar. She is to be accompanied on the mission by the Great Artiste and Big Stink. But... On August 9th, 
During the pre-flight checks, Boxcar's crew uncover a problem with their fuel transfer pump. Unable to use the aircraft's 640-gallon fuel reserve, Sweeney now faces a crucial dilemma. If he proceeds with the mission, he may not have the necessary fuel to make the return journey. However, if he spends multiple hours required to replace the pump, the predicted bad weather will likely cause the mission to be postponed. Grasping the importance of the mission, Sweeney takes a gamble and gives the mission the green light. Shortly after, at 03.49, Boxcar taxis down the runway on Tinian and heads for Japan. As she arrives at the rendezvous point above Yakushima Island, only one of her escorts is there to meet her. After circling the island for 40 minutes, unaware of his fuel issues, Sweeney decides to proceed with the mission without the escort of Big Stink, and sets a course for Kokura. But this delay has come at a price. When Boxcar and the Great Artiste arrive over Kokura, a thick cloud of smoke from the previous day's firebombing raid on Yahata has rolled over the city, reducing visibility to 30%. Boxcar makes three bomb runs over the city but is unable to identify the target. Low on fuel, Sweeney is now faced with a second dilemma. If he turns and heads for the secondary target, he won't have enough fuel to make it back to Tinian. However, should he turn back now, he'll have to ditch America's only remaining nuclear bomb in the Pacific Ocean. In a crucial decision of the Pacific War, Sweeney opts to hit the secondary target. Boxcar and the Great Artiste now turn southwest towards Nagasaki. 0750. Nagasaki's air raid sirens ring out as the two bombers are picked up on the radar. Miraculously, for the second atomic mission in a row, the B 29s are deemed to be a reconnaissance mission, and at 0830, Nagasaki's sirens sound the all clear. At 1053, at an altitude of 31,000 feet, the two B-29s arrive over the cloud-covered city. Unable to sight the target on his first run, Sweeney spots a break in the clouds and lines Boxcar up for one final attempt. At 11.01, Bombardier Captain Kermit Beenham visually sights the target, and at 11.02, he releases the bomb. Fat Man, containing a 5kg plutonium core, detonates 47 seconds later, directly above a tennis court near the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works. The explosion releases 21 kilotons of energy and destroys 1.8 square miles of Nagasaki, killing some 35,000 people and injuring 60,000 more. Despite releasing more energy than Little Boy, a major part of Nagasaki is spared from destruction as the bomb falls off target and detonates in the Urakami Valley region of the city. Immediately after the detonation, Boxcar heads for the closest U.S. airbase on the recently captured island of Okinawa. Gliding in on empty fuel tanks, she makes an emergency landing and stops just short of the end of the runway. The use of a second bomb in three days and the Soviet Union's declaration of war against Japan on August 9th shakes Japan to its core. Many within the Japanese government now consider the unthinkable and forward a motion to accept the terms of surrender. With the vote tied, Prime Minister Suzuki goes to the Imperial Palace and pleads with Emperor Hirohito to break the deadlock. Wishing to put an end to the suffering of his people, Hirohito chooses to accept surrender. On August 15, 1945, for the first time in history, the Japanese people listened to a radio address from their emperor who asked them to bear the unbearable and surrender to the Allied powers. The Second World War is now effectively over. In the decades that have passed, many have questioned the use of two atomic bombs on Japan, and different perspectives often yield different answers. But all agree on one point summed up perfectly by the following quote. The consequences of using the bomb and the suffering it caused to tens of thousands for many years after the events highlights why this horrific weapon has not been used again and hopefully never will be. <laughs>